my name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, EESI. And I must say, it is a privilege to work with the Northeast Midwest uh, Congressional Coalition and also the Senate Coalition. And I hope that everyone really understands how deep their concern and support for this important weatherization program has been. And it is, um, I think, a, a testament to the reach of the program, the impact of the program, uh, in terms of seeing how various members of Congress have championed this enormously important program for many years, uh, for, uh, for now about 30 years. And what, as Kate was saying, what's really, really critical is that there is a very, very important success story that we wanted to be part of telling. And so we are also very glad to be partnering with regard to this briefing with the National Association for State Community Services Programs. I think what's really important for all of us to remember is, as Kate was saying, with regard to this program, we now are seeing, as a result of the investment through the, uh, through the recovery program, that there have now been a million homes that have been weatherized. That is a very, very important story and a very important success from many different levels, from the, from the families, the households whose lives have been touched uh, as a result of this program and being able to see their energy bills reduced, uh, being able to live in a safer and healthier home and one that is much more energy efficient to the fact that there are now lots of people who have been trained across the country that have expertise that is now really critical with regard to the whole energy efficiency retrofit industry across the country. And in addition, we have seen the weatherization program pioneer technology that is used to both provide ever better services for the program, but ever better technology that is available to the whole retrofit industry. So there, and, and of course, all of the goods and services that are made, and we're going to hear more about this from our speakers today, but it's, it's also an important part of the success story that all of the goods and services are, in terms of that supply chain, it is coming from all over our country, and that therefore there are many, many jobs and uh, economic activities that are connected to this very successful story. So I want to start by introducing Mark Wolf, who is the Executive Director of the Energy Programs Consortium. And Mark has a very, very long history in terms of working with these programs and has a very varied background. Uh, and there are short bios for all of our speakers on the back of your briefing notice. And Mark uh, has worked very, very hard to help tell these stories and now he has also helped put together a film that to help tell the story. He's going to just show some very brief clips and talk briefly about the program. Mark? Thank you. Um, thank you. I also represent the state directors of the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LAHEAP. And one thing I've learned over the years is that there are many people on the Hill that think by supporting LAHEAP, they're also supporting the weatherization program as if it's one program. In fact, they're two separate distinct programs, and we are deeply concerned about the funding situation for weatherization. It is our companion program, and while paying the bill is important, it's also very important to weatherize and strengthen the home. Um, just a couple of, of quick facts, and I'd like to introduce, introduce our film. Um, we started about two years ago to do about a 10-minute uh, history of the program. And as word got around, people started sending us things, things that were in their basements, you know, uh, early manuals, uh, an early blower door, early equipment. And as we began to collect these, these very interesting, almost historical artifacts, it's 30 years now, we started to realize that, in fact, many of the people who helped to, to start the weather revision program were leaving the scene, were retiring, were moving on. And we realized they had a very important story to tell. And that evolved into a 15-minute documentary. Um, now, we did, I think, hand out copies of the documentary. Um, Lois and Barbara, I think, maybe have some extra copies over there. Uh, it's also online. Uh, the State and Local Energy Report 
is the magazine of the four major organizations that represent state energy officials, and they were the sponsor of the film, along with the National Association of State Community Services Programs that represents the state weatherization directors. Just a couple of key points I'd like to make about the film. Uh, we don't have time to show it today. It's 50 minutes, so I'm just going to show some, some clips from some of the interviews that we did. Um, but there are a couple of interesting things. If you think back 30 years, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember this, and I, I really thought I would never be in the position of ever saying that myself, um, this, was, this grew out of the early days of the energy crisis. Uh, we have archival footage of Walter Cronkite talking about weatherization, uh, Jimmy Carter, if you remember those days. Um, and one thing that people forget, 50% of low-income families are homeowners, where about 70% of all Americans are homeowners. Still, many, many poor families, lower-income families, own homes. And for those families, weatherization is more than just doing you know, heating uh, and, and weatherization work. And when you start to think of the kinds of things that we do, it's helping to stabilize their homes. So it's more than just furnace replacement. You're doing major important work to that house to help them stay in that home. And for them, what might appear to middle class families as not major improvements really are significant. There are two key things that are covered in the documentary that I think are really important takeaways about weatherization. One, it's, it, it created the history of building science for energy efficiency. A lot of the things that we take for common now in energy efficiency grew out of the weatherization program. We interviewed people who were early weatherizers, uh, to use that phrase, um, and they would say things like, well, we started with a truck and a hammer and a screwdriver, and they said, go do something with that house. Um, and so people started to learn, how do you help tighten up the house, how do you help reduce energy, and that led to things today like the more sophisticated blower doors that we have, infrared equipment to look for leaks, all of that grew out of weatherization. Um, that also helped to develop what we now have as the Home Performance and Energy Star program, which really is a crossover from weatherization to more middle and upper middle class homes. Um, with that, I'd like to share just a couple of the interviews that we did for the film. Um, these are people in companies that um, were weatherizing and really kind of talk about what it meant to them. I'd like to start with Carolyn um, Naki, who is in Washington State and is a family that was weatherized recently and is in, in our film. I think this is how you do it. Uh, maybe not. Oh, that's it. Right through the mess. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I work at the local high school, and I, I work in the office. My hours were cut two years ago, and it, it adds up. You don't have that paycheck, and getting older, any time in my house, no matter how much I tried, you could always feel a draft. The weatherization people came in and they put insulation in places that never did have it before. I have a gas fireplace and a gas heater. And now I feel safe and secure because I do have a, a reliable carbon monoxide detector that was put in. My electric bill has gone down and my gas bill has gone down. Since they've made the changes in the insulation and the walls and everything, I feel I sleep better at night. When they told me I was getting all this, I I cried. I really did cry because it was a blessing. I mean, I could not believe it. It just made the world's difference to me in a comfort zone, knowing that this was taken care of. My home is better. I'm better. Life is better. The um, second uh, short clip is Rod and Janice. It's a good example, I think, of supply chain issues. Um, many of the people that work in weatherization, they're not doing to become wealthy. We don't have wealthy contractors. These are people who are dedicated people. They work really hard, and the reimbursements are low. They do it because they want to help families. And this is a good example of the kinds of companies that I believe are at risk through these cutbacks. Nope. I got involved in uh, weatherization in 1978. I started out with the Miss Valley of Anchorage and eventually into owning my own business. 
moved down to Washington and has expanded the business to where it's at today. Once I realized the uh, impact that Aura was going to have on the program, I realized I wasn't going to be able to manage this business by myself. So I ended up uh, robbing my daughter from another company. About three years ago, I, I came on board to help manage the office side of things. So it's been extremely exciting. We've increased the number of units that we've weatherized per year in the last two years. I really have felt that I've been of service. Going to people's homes that are not actually doing well and, and really can actually uplift their spirits when someone come in and, and provide this type of service for them. I think sometimes what people forget is that when you live in an area like Washington where homes can be $500,000 or $700,000, for many people, they live in parts of the country where a home is $100,000. You know, it's not a large valuable property, but for them that's all they have. And they don't have the money to maintain it, so, they, so it gradually deteriorates. And what weatherization does is help to stabilize that property. Um, I'd like to do just two more. Um, the, the good stories, I think, particularly filter down to the employees as well as the uh, homeowners themselves. It's allowed us to build jobs and thousands of people and also uh, do something well at the same time. Most clients that we deal with, they have very old air conditioners and they're not very efficient at all. We've done a lady's house in Vera <laughs> Beach. She was 92 years old and been sleeping out on the front porch for the last three months. Hadn't had an air conditioner in, in a year. And that was in the heat of August, you know. And after we left there, I mean, she was teared up. And that's, that moves you. It makes you really feel happy of what you got at the house, you know. When I first started, started doing inspections, we had a lady, she was blind, and this was a final inspection, we've already done all the work, and she was running around the house screaming happy as could be, and she couldn't see what we'd done, but she could notice the difference in the house, she could feel the difference in the house, and it was just crazy seeing her being so happy, and knowing that she felt the difference without seeing it, it really shows that it works. I'd like to finish up with um, a short video from uh, the Community Development Corporation of Long Island. They do weatherization for, I think, most of the island. And again, I think captures the sense of the dedication of the workers who are out there helping families who really have very, very little other than their house. Community Development Corporation of Long Island. I, uh, I basically supervise every aspect of weatherization from the auditors first coming in uh, to our crews doing the work, to our contractors doing the work, uh, to our final post inspections. Each home I go into, basically, uh, it, it's kind of good because I get to see the before and after. So in each home, I see the impact we make. Every house is different. 
Uh, you, you could have a house on the reservation that kind of is 200 years old. You could have a mobile home. It's, you see everything uh, and you see anything. And it changes constantly and that's what makes the job fun. It's, it's always new. Every year, every training we go to, we learn something new and it's something that you can carry over and it's knowledge that you could use on your own home and, and your own life and your own family. I can see myself doing it for the rest of my life just because of, of I'm so interested in it. I'm so happy to be helping people and uh, I just, I, I, I love the learning aspect and, and it's just, it's been a great experience overall for the past uh, nine years. I wouldn't change anything. Hey, lastly, um, if we do run out of copies of the video, um, it is also online on the State and Local Energy Report website. Thank you. Thanks very, very much, Mark. And I hope everybody does take the time to look at the film. It's very, very moving, as we just saw with regard to, to these clips. Um, and, and in terms of the impact on people, whether it's their homes or whether they're doing the jobs, um, is really, really an incredible story. Uh, we're now going to hear from David Hempenstahl, who is Executive Director for the Association for Energy Affordability. And he has, um, while he is located in New York, he has been working with, with people in terms of uh, being a very, very important, playing a very important role in the training and engineering services that are so critical to making weatherization a success. David? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I want to also just quickly about AEA. We are a membership organization and uh, of weatherization subgrantees in downstate New York, and we actually have eight weatherization directors from Brooklyn and Manhattan and the Bronx. Okay, in Long Island, in the room with us today. Okay, raise your hands here, weatherization agents. All right, and uh, and actually. Uh, we have a, a total of 12 people who are here today from, from New York, and, we, and I was thinking about the extent to which folks don't realize how long many of us have been toiling on this weatherization front. So many people in the last few years uh, come up to us and, and basically say, as Dan was just at an EBA conference this week, and, and somebody, what, oh, but weatherization started with ERA, right? Okay, well, collectively, we have 235 years of direct service and weatherization from 12 people here. That's an average of almost 20 years that each of us has been involved. So, and let me just say that, um, you know, I've been directly involved in this program since 1990, okay, personally, and the professionalism and the commitment of quality professional staff in the program in New York City has been awesome. And we're going to talk about a, a bit about multifamily, okay, but let me just say our perspective is we serve the people who are low income in our city, okay, and actually we consider downstate, that's Westchester, that's Long Island, not just the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, and we, AEA, does energy audits. Okay, uh, for most of those folks, uh, although Dan Reber is self-auditing agency, some of those are, but we also are a direct services provider, okay, and Francis Rodriguez is our weatherization director in the South Bronx, and actually for a couple of contracts just under, under ERA, uh, AEA has weatherized 75 buildings, okay, with almost 5,000 units under era ourselves, and our energy efficiency engineers during this period have done comprehensive energy audits on over 600 buildings with over 42,000 units. During era, we moved from an agency of 50 people to 138. Okay, we had to do that to be able to hire the professionals, the energy engineering staff to do energy audits on multifamily buildings. 
I know it, we do a lot of training in workforce development at the beginning of ERA. I, was, I wasn't shocked, okay, but I was a bit surprised that people really began to think of weatherization as, oh, it's weather stripping. And all you, need, you don't need a GED, you don't need anything. Well, in my environment, we've been working in a multifamily. Sure, we do a lot of workforce training that brings folks from that category into various jobs, but frankly, uh, in our recruitment, to expand our en energy engineering staff for weatherization in New York, we hired, a, we interviewed 104 people nationally to hire about 14 engineers, okay? Uh, we recruited effectively, but then going back to the folks in the room, okay, who've been dealing with, on the front lines, with weatherization on an average of 20 years. And in multifamily, you know, I'll get to it more later, but. In the city of New York, two-thirds of all people and all households live in multifamily buildings, okay? That still means we have a million households living in one to fours, okay? But we have 2.2 million living in multifamily buildings. So because there's a range of people who have a range of understanding, of a few background things. This is traditionally, nationally, it's a community action agencies and community-based not-for-profit organizations, but it's in every state, okay? And typically this means in most of our states, that means in every county. Clearly in New York, it's rural, urban, it's every, it's single family, it's a variety of, of settings, but it's always targeting the most vulnerable in our society who are not themselves as likely to be able to be in a position to pay for the, the uh, addressing the energy waste and the high cost of energy. Uh, Okay, the, um, one of the things that was mentioned will be mentioned again. It's been historically true that weatherization has been an inf incubator for new technology. One of the key th reasons, of course, is a lot of people who 30 years ago, you know, in the Carter administration first got involved in the program, you know, were folks who were trying to figure out, solve problems, figure out how do we actually solve these problems, and it really has been the driver, okay? And, the fact that we've become part of the, you know, funded by the Department of Energy, it's interesting. I've always felt they've hadn't, haven't shown as adequate respect for the extent to which we are a field-based R&D program. Frankly, we're out there in the field working in real conditions with, with strong folks. Uh, and so the policy driver for what we've been doing in terms of the new technologies always been coming up with new ways to, to save fund money for folks. Um, and we've been very much engaged in that in the R&D side with wireless technology. We've got our own organization. We've got a 30,000 foot training center in, in the South Bronx. We are connected to many buildings in downstate New York, real time monitoring temperature in, in apartments, okay, uh, adjusting temperatures, managing with building, operator, building owners and building operators to achieve best uh, energy status. So, and again, historically, it's. Kind of hard to believe there was once an era in Washington that kind of, I grew up in coming here a fair amount. Okay, my senator was Javits. He was a Republican. He was probably one of the more, you know, liberal senators, okay? And weatherization program actually has been historically fully a bipartisan supported program. It's been traditionally true at every stage. A major reason is because I think, I've always thought, it's the workforce engaged and the companies doing the work were small businesses, okay? But it was also so responsive to the districts that congressmen served. Um, so one million homes, whether it's since 2009, you know, we really do have a lot to celebrate. I mean, one million homes, when the president in the campaign was talking about a, a goal of, it, of weatherizing a million homes, you know, people including a lot of people in weatherization who nationally were getting on average 225 to 240 million dollars a year. It was kind of five billion and ramp up now from an average of 225 to 240 to five billion. Well, five billion is over three years and 250 million was over one year. And so let's get these things lined up a bit. Okay. Uh, but one way or another, whatever way you look at it, it's got to be at least four times as big overnight, okay? Um, but uh, by the way, my numbers that I saw in June were 750,000 uh, directly attributable 
to era. But people forget the era dollars, everybody had their demands. In New York, we had a 2009 contract, a base contract people were working on. And New York said, hey, you can't slow down in any of that. You do the 2009 until all this Davis Bacon and everything else gets sorted out. You're doing 2009, and then we're doing 2010, and we're doing 2011 contracts at the same time. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, looking back, a lot of us do remember that it got started in, you know, with Carter. Okay. Looking back to 2009, we, we also, a lot of us remember this was a big challenge. Okay, but we responded, okay? And, you know, in New York and nationally, and I'm gonna get into some of the kinds of numbers here, um, basically, we, we saw that around the country, the responses varied a heck of a lot, no question. But there's a lot of building on the existing infrastructure, okay? Um, one of the key things that's important to remember is there were some of us for whom weatherization actually had been a small share of the total of what we were doing in energy efficiency. In Massachusetts and Ohio and in our case in New York, actually we had more NYSERDA nice and utility dollars supporting what we were doing often over these years than weatherization dollars. Okay, and I think the survival of that existing network is a really critical in terms of being able to play a, a critical role nationally in utility programs. People don't fully realize the extent to which that infrastructure in critical places really is weatherization. Quickly give you a sense of, you know, multifamily buildings is where we primarily work, and in fact, we've got pictures of multifamily buildings around the country. We have a, law, we have a strong office in California as well. Um, and just some numbers have gotten your handouts as well, but, you know, there's a lot more multifamily, residential multifamily housing eligible for weatherization than is often assumed. People just assume it's a single family program. I've got some regional data, some city data in, in the handout. You should look at it. It's clearly Atlanta, Boston, Houston, Seattle, and Chicago all have close to half are in multi unit buildings. We look at 10 or more, that's even, it's, uh, in, you know, some places it's even more important. That I, I just want to throw a few things out in terms of New York as well, specifically, because we had a target of less, of, um, I guess, 58,000 or so under era statewide 72,000, you know, and of that 86% were uh, in multifamily units, okay? I'm basically showing data about the 2008, nine, or the 9, 10, and 11 as well in the total numbers. Ultimately during that period, just as nationally there's a million homes in New York, actually it's over 100,000 units during this era period that have been served. So, I mean, I've got some information on why do we do multifamily and ultimately at the end of the day, uh, that's where most of the low income actually live in New York City, okay? And, and it's critically important that we're responsive where they, where they live. It, what's different about apartment buildings? Typically, not just in New York City, but many of our, our central city, large urban areas around the country, uh, heat and hot water are included in the rent, okay? And basically, everyone who lives in the building is paying a contribution toward that. When we're reducing, Operating costs were reducing the, upper, the upward pressure on rents and pre preserving affordable housing. Uh, and affordable housing is a critical component of our mission. Okay, um, measures I'm not gonna get into, but some pictures here, we do an incredible variety of very responsive, up-to-date measures, and that's really coming from specifying audits with strong auditors, and I gotta really give a shout out to DOE stewardship, frankly, on, on this issue of the workforce, okay, and standard work specifications and all that uh, the team at DOE have been doing really incredible work and we want to build, that, build on that. And so there's really not time for me to do more than be ready to respond to questions, but I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, David. And um, and hopefully you all will have questions once we hear from all of our speakers. Uh, we will now hear from John Joseph. Uh, Dr. Joseph is the CEO of JII Software. He comes to us from, from Maine. Um, and his company has been involved in uh, specializing in energy auditing and weatherization program management. Uh, he also is a professor of economics and he's a former state uh, energy director in Maine, so he's able to weave all of that together. Okay. Dr. Joseph.
Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. I got on an airplane from Portland, Maine this morning at uh, 6 o'clock and left my home at 4. <laughs> so I'm about uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Uh, I went to graduate school here in uh, Washington, D.C. at Georgetown in 1973 uh, during the uh, first oil embargo. And uh, I experienced the gasoline lines and the question of whether or not I was actually going to be able to go back to Maine at Christmas time. I had a young baby at the time. And so it made a very big impression on me. And I went back to Maine and decided to have my career there and uh, had the opportunity to become director of the Maine Office of Energy Resources. And you know the Chinese curse, may you have an interesting job in interesting times. I was there during the Iranian oil embargo and the Iranian revolution and uh, really was uh, touched by the importance of the energy problem to our economy and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, I am trained as an economist, but I run an IT company, and we're doing, we do uh, software for the LIHEAP program, and we do software for the weatherization program. Um, the first economic aspect of uh, weatherization that I would like to focus on is that it was part of the 1976 Energy Act, and the purpose was to save energy. Why? Because the people in these homes couldn't afford to save energy. So you could have a situation where you have an excellent rate of return on investment, but there's no money to invest in it. So there, in an economic sense, there's real value there. We're enhancing the wealth of our nation by doing this. Even though the money's not coming from the homeowner, it's creating uh, you know, value and wealth. So from an economic point of view, we're building from the ground up with this program. Uh, in Maine, we did a carbon uh, methodology so that the carbon credits from weatherization would be acceptable in a national, international, voluntary carbon markets as an opportunity to bring more money into the program. So we developed this methodology, which was approved by the, the validators, and, and, uh, and it uh, actually resulted in a sale. We sold 80% of our, our homes in Maine, we sold the carbon credits. So we were able to kind of meld those two things together in the fast-moving carbon uh, era era. Uh, we had to prove additionality, which was that these houses would not have been weatherized without the weatherization money. So we took all the bills from like uh, 50,000 LIHEAP uh, recipients in the state of Maine looked at their energy bills from year to year and found that over the rip, period of time where we were measuring the savings to weather, from weatherized homes, the, the other homes that we didn't put any money into had a savings rate of 0.38%, basically insignificant savings in the single family and multifamily, demonstrating that these folks don't have the resources to weatherize these homes. So I think that's the first uh, observation I wanted to offer you. The second one is that the weatherization funding is, a, is an investment, it's not an expenditure. Now, if we had Warren Buffett here, he'd know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, fundamentals of business is you can even borrow money for an investment. It makes sense. So if you want to run a government deficit and invest the money, it's logical. But borrowing money for operating expenses is a different story. And I just want to make the distinction that Investment is a weatherization expenditure is an investment. It has long-lasting returns, 20 years. All the training centers that were built are an investment. The trained staff is human capital. Every task that saves energy has to have a savings to investment ratio of one, which is in the private sector is called a profitability ratio, same thing. If you can find a profitability ratio greater than one in your company, you're adding value to the company. The stockholders are going to be happy. That is the same rule that's used in what other government program has that kind of strict economic criteria associated with it. So this is an investment. Not only does it have a positive cash flow, it very likely has a growing cash flow. How many of your portfolios have a growing cash flow? 
How many investments do we have in America right now that we can validate the cash flow and know it's there and measure it and count on it and expect it to go up as the price of energy goes up in the future, which, you know, none of us know the future, but if you want to take bets, I'm holding a little uh, session back here a little bit later and we can do that. Uh, so WAP is not a cost center, it's an investment center. There's a whole supply chain associated with this, and, and I was asked to focus on this because I'm in the supply chain, but I'm in the technology side of it. You know, we're not a weatherization contractor, but we're bringing IT technology improvements to the weatherization process. That's the new innovation. Uh, this sector is large. It's been documented by a study that was done by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, Ernest Orlando, and it's called the energy efficiency service sector, of which weatherization is a small part because it has all utility programs and private auditors, et cetera, et cetera, construction contractors that are doing industrial projects, anything around energy efficiencies in here. It's, so we're a small part of that, but we're a very important part of that. We're the foundation. When I say we, I mean the weatherization program is the foundation of that national energy efficiency system in the sense that it's, it's national in scope. It has an integrated network which includes every state, the territories, the tribal organization, all these community-based organizations, and a huge cadre of private companies. I mean, just the infrastructure of all that is incredibly valuable. We cannot let that fall apart. We've done the training in this program, developed the standards. I know there's BPI and there's all these private groups, but if you go back and scratch the surface, you're going to find that BPI guy once worked in a weatherization program. And weatherization has been said before, but, uh, and I, I guess I'm repeating a little bit of this, but uh, it has been a catalyst for innovation in res residential weatherization. Uh, all the energy modeling, the stuff that we do, comes out of the weatherization program. The blower door test that measures infiltration comes out of the weatherization program. The infrared cameras come out of the weatherization program. The idea of adding health and safety considerations to the home comes out of the residential program. And the training and certification. So all of the professional infrastructure comes from the weatherization program. It, weatherization is going to continue to be a catalyst, and, and I'm going to focus a little bit on what the, kind, the aspect that we're involved in. Um, our software is improving the monitoring and inspection process. All the data is in one place. The data is going to be uploaded into a, a computer model that makes it suitable for selling in the carbon market. We've improved the accuracy of, money of this, these energy audits. We've gone through the latest DOE review for accuracy of audits, and all the audits were overestimating savings. And we all know that. So I think now we're tightening that up. We're getting really serious about what's uh, all the calculations. And uh, here's another innovation in, in uh, weatherization that many of you might not be aware of, but uh, under NASCASP, the weatherization plus health and safety has become a, a new focal point. And I heard an interesting talk at the last conference where they were talking about, you know, finding asthma triggers in homes and measuring the CO2 emissions and the unfa un unsafe structures and fire protection. And my question is, what is the economics of all that? If you take a young, young child and get rid of the asthma trigger in the home and he doesn't go to the hospital, how many times have you paid for that inspection? And if you prevent the fire, how many times have you paid for that fire prevention? And if you eliminate carbon, uh, you know, carbon monoxide and save a life, I mean, what is the worth of that? These are real economic savings, and these people are out in the homes now doing the health and safety. So that could be integrated with other governmental services for health and safety in these homes. And other than, econo other than the economics of energy, the number one economic problem we have in this country is the health care costs. 
And this program is con contributing to reducing health care costs. It may not be controlling prices in hospitals, but it's keeping people out of hospitals. And it may not be enormous, but it's one step at a time, isn't it, really? And when I talk about this program being a catalyst, I just want to remind us all that this idea of a government program being a catalyst for private development has been around for a long time. And those that think that the government doesn't play a role are not reading history because the computer comes from the U.S. Navy. <clears throat> the satellites come from NASA, all your cell phones. Radar uh, research developed the television and the Air Force developed the wide body jet which brought me here this morning at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, you know, this, the, the network is huge. The small business contractors, uh, I heard one of them, uh, Hawkeye Construction out of Baltimore, during our, they hired uh, 40 people and God bless them. And here's a uh, good example of the, uh, the value chain. Program director, uh, staff employee at Home Depot and two energy auditors. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, John. We are now going to turn to Richard Caperton, who is the Director of Clean Energy Investment with the Center for American Progress Action Fund. And he's going to uh, talk about supply chain and a new uh, issue brief that, that the center is just releasing today. Thank you, Carol, and thanks to ESI for doing this. Uh, among your, your other great projects, uh, this is a, a great organization. It's good to be here uh, speaking at one of your events. Um, again, my name is Richard Caperton. I work at a nonprofit think tank, nonpartisan think tank here in Washington, D.C., called the Center for American Progress. And uh, we've released a new paper today. It's called The Federal Weatherization Program is a Winner on All Counts. I've got two of my co authors on the paper, Adam James and Matt Casper, with me today, and thanks for their help. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that paper, but uh, before I do that, frankly, I think um, some of the paper may be a little bit dull compared to what we've heard today uh, and what we've seen in this video and what we've heard of the benefits of the program. I think if you think of just the, the energy savings in a house, that's a little bit short-sighted. If you just think about the supply chain and some of the companies in the supply chain, that's a little bit short-sighted. I think if you think about improving comfort in people's lives, that's, that's what this program is about. And it's about making people's lives and maybe making people's homes better. So let's just uh, put that context out there that what I'm talking about here is not the whole story. The whole story is improving people's lives. Um, our paper is about this, that energy efficiency is a win-win-win for, for Americans. It saves homeowners money. I'll talk a little bit about that, put some facts on that. Uh, puts Americans back to work. I'm going to focus on the manufacturing sector, but this employs people throughout the supply chain, as we've heard. And uh, I think it's important not to disregard the fact that this helps avoid the most catastrophic ca consequences of climate change. So first, uh, weatherization, it actually does save people money. Uh, let's not forget that. This helps families save more than $400 on heating and cooling bills in the first year. This is data from the, the entire history of the weatherization program. Reduces homeowners' energy consumption by 35%. That's real savings. And in 2010 alone, families combined saved $2.1 billion. Um, those are real. Again, add on all the other benefits of just improving people's comfort zone in their house that we heard about. And those are significant savings. And the, the thing is, is that these are real savings for people who need it. Um, Low-income families benefit from weatherization. And this is just the, the criteria of the program, that uh, any household at or below 200% of the poverty line qualifies to apply. And you get a huge number of households that meet that bare minimum standard. And in that, that number of 38 million, uh, we give priority to families with children, homeowners who are elderly or disabled. These are very vulnerable people who need the assistance. Now, these people, they're not just located in certain states and certain parts of the country. They're located all across the country and weatherization funds flow all across the country. Now, of course, a state like California actually does get a lot of money. In New York, it's a huge amount of money from WAP. Um, this does it on a per capita basis so that the states with extremely uh, high weatherization needs, Maine, North Dakota, South Dakota, 
are going to be the primary beneficiaries on a per capita basis. And then you're more, uh, uh, your states would just less need Florida, uh, temperate climate like California, have, have less for this program. Now this is data that comes up to, I think, 2010. Um, it's very possible that as we learn more about the needs for cooling in hot weather climates, uh, as the effects of climate change become worse and cooling needs just become higher across the country, that these places in the, the Sun Belt are going to need more weatherization on a per capita basis. So I, I would not be surprised to see those numbers change a little bit in the future. Now, in addition to benefiting the people in their homes, it's important to think about the supply chain. This is some data that comes from the Home, uh, the home Performance Resource Center, and they've done a, a pretty neat study looking at how much of the materials used in retrofits are made in America and find that on the average it's 89% of the things are manufactured here. Now the way they did this was they looked at uh, NAICS codes and just found how big the industry for say duct sheet metal is in the United States and then looked at some tariff databases and found out how much we were importing of that and the remainder was manufactured here. So 99.4% of duct sheet metal is that we use in weatherization is manufactured here in the United States. 95.9% .9 of rigid foam insulation Everything is a very good, uh, refrigerators are not on this chart. Those are the lowest manufacturing percentage in the U.S. It's something like 62%, but everything else is very, very good. And again, that 89% number compares very favorably to the average, the bottom right here is the average for all manufactured goods across the economy, which is 76.5%. Um, so clearly weatherization has a, a better economic impact than a lot of other investments you could make in the manufacturing sector. Finally, every house that's weatherized reduces carbon dioxide by 2.65 metric tons a year. And in the power sector, uh, we emitted about 2 billion metric tons of carbon last year. But we've weatherized 2 million homes, so that's getting to be a significant impact on the power sector emissions. Um, if we weatherized a lot more homes, obviously the impact would be bigger. But this is a, these numbers add up relatively quickly, and you're starting to make a real impact on avoiding the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. And over the life of the measures, again, we're saving 53 metric tons of CO2 per house. So I want to thank you again for inviting me. Um, this has just been a, a brief summary. We've got our paper, uh, I think it's on the table outside as you leave, if you didn't pick it up on the way in. I encourage you to. It's also at our website, AmericanProgress.org. And uh, I'm also uh, always happy to come and meet with anybody on the Hill and talk about these issues or, or off the Hill. Uh, feel free to get in touch. There's my contact information. and send the, the handouts that are there. But thanks again to EESI, and thanks for all of your hard work on this program. Thanks very much, Rich. And uh, our final speaker, before we open it up for your questions and comments, is Brad Penny, who is the general counsel with Advocates for the Other America. And he will sort of sum up, put the kind of the whole thing in context. Because as you can hear from what everybody has said, the weatherization program reaches into people's lives in so many different ways and all across the country and is a very, very compelling story. Brad? Carol, thank you very much. And <clears throat> let me just add to what the other speakers have said. Um, our appreciation at NASCASP and advocates uh, for your great work in putting this briefing together. And uh, we're particularly proud, uh, those of us who are involved with the program, that we can do this on the day uh, or day after the one millionth home was weatherized. So we quickly want to get into questions. You've been a very patient audience. This has been a great briefing, and I'm sure you do have a lot of questions. But what I'd like to do is, having heard of the great successes of this program uh, and the tremendous contribution it makes uh, not only to those who benefit from having their homes weatherized, but as we've heard, to our economy and to uh, reducing the carbon footprint, I now have the difficult task of kind of uh, telling you the very grim facts on the future of the program. Because sadly, despite everything we've heard here this morning, the technology benefits, uh, everything else that our wonderful speakers have projected here today, uh, we are here this morning uh, asking for your help at a point at which the future of the program is gravely jeopardized. 
So as you've heard, and Kate gave a very nice kind of overview at the beginning of the numbers, weatherization in the pre-recovery act years was essentially, as, as Dave said, in the range of about 205 million annually to 240 million. Uh, varied, but in the five to seven years before the Recovery Act, that was the average. So then we had the, uh, the surge of funding, the $5 billion, and uh, you know, it's our, our view at NASCASP and advocates that I think that everyone involved with the program, the Department of Energy, just a really superlative job to get to the point where we are today of having weatherized one million homes. That is an incredible accomplishment, given some of the obstacles that the program confronted at the beginning of the Recovery Act. One obstacle that became apparent as we reached the peak of the uh, stimulus funding was that there was going to come a point at which there would be a lot of weatherization money in the pipeline, unspent Recovery Act dollars, and yet the need for new program year funding for weatherization. And that year was fiscal year 12. And the program received only $68 million. And the reason Congress did that was because at that point, and depending on you know, what point in time you look at, there, there may have been something in the range of, of $700 million to $800 million in unexpended Recovery Act dollars in the pipeline. Well, that was fiscal year 12. Where we now have been caught in a, a really dangerous bind for the program going forward is that with regard to fiscal year 13, we're now operating under a continuing resolution for the first six months of the year. And that is, as CRs are, uh, it, it's a continuation of funding at last year's level. <clears throat> there was a six-tenths of 1% increase, which is a de minimis across the board increase in discretionary spending. Essentially, right now, weatherization is at that uh, CR level, but it's not even 68 million because the Department of Energy, uh, two things, two factors, they've been directed by OMB to spend out only at a rate of 28% for all EERE programs, 28% of the FY12 level. And the department also, uh, because they have to do this in a CR situation, they take the lower of the two numbers, as Kate mentioned, the 54 million is the House uh, Appropriations Committee number for weatherization in FY13, 145 million is the Senate number. DOE has to take the lower of the two, unfortunately. So when they take out the money for the training and administrative side of the program, that leaves only $51 million in the continuing resolution for uh, FY13. So where do we need your help? We need a national movement to save the weatherization program. That's what we want to ask you uh, to join us in, in doing here today. Weatherization works. We've seen that in this briefing. We've heard from our speakers. What we need is a national coalition we need the supply chain companies. We need the private sector. We need the companies that have created real new jobs and have helped people uh, to improve their economic situation. We need the support of faith-based organizations, a number of whom we have reached out to. Uh, we need unified action from every stakeholder in this room and in this country who cares about the future of the weatherization program. Because if we do not have this national movement to save weatherization, I fear that we will be caught, despite the successes which you've heard here this morning, uh, I'm afraid we'll be caught in this budget cutting frenzy because we haven't even talked about the prospect of sequestration, which would be another 8.2% off of the $51 million if sequestration happens. <clears throat> we have not talked about the importance of the FY14 budget ask, which is critical. If we cannot get the administration to propose funding that is back to the pre-Recovery Act levels, which remember we said was kind of the range of 205 million to 240 million. If we cannot get back to that level, we are not going to have a national weatherization program going forward. Because if you look at the numbers, the continuation at the spending level contained in the continuing resolution, Hawaii is going to be weatherizing seven homes in the uh, 2013 program year. Uh, Delaware is going to be weatherizing something like 20, 24 homes. So you go state by state, and it is really staggering. And while many states do have LIHEAP, as Mark mentioned, and uh, there's leveraging opportunities with utilities, 
there are states like Missouri that does not have any LIHEAP li money. So they're not going to have a program at the funding levels that, that we're getting right now from the Congress. So I'd like to just make two or three points because we do want to get to the questions. The first is we need your help right away to support an ask of no less than $210 million in fiscal year 2014. That's going to be crucial to the survival of the program. The OMB passbacks, for those of you who are familiar with the budget process, the time between now and November, irrespective of the election, this process is going forward. And that time is really crucial. So we would ask each of you to uh, reach out to your uh, congressmen and senators and urge them to support, uh, as one of our speakers said, weatherization has always been viewed with bipartisan support. And we need to continue that, and we need to have members on both sides supporting the request for no less than $210 million in fiscal year 14. It is absolutely critical that we return the program to the pre-ARA levels of, of funding. The second thing where we need your help is that when we get to the next continuing resolution, which expires on March 27th, at that point we will be past the fiscal cliff. We'll know what's happened or not happened with sequestration. We're going to need your help to plus up the weatherization account, uh, either in a second continuing resolution uh, or in an omnibus. As, as you know, if the Congress does what they're supposed to be doing, they will pass an energy and water appropriations bill. Hopefully we will get the Senate number. We're going to work with our champions, uh, C. Franz here from Office of Senator Coons, who's been so supportive of the weatherization program, Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island, Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio. We have a tremendous group of champions, Steve Israel in the House, uh, the members of the SEEC and Kate's Northeast Midwest Coalition. Um, but we need really your voices. Those of you who are in the room today, you care about the program. Uh, we're here to tell you today that its future is jeopardized, and without a real national movement, we need to make some noise. We need to convince members of Congress and the administration that people care about this program and that we are going to fight for its uh, survival. I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, my friend and colleague, Arlie Johnson in the back. We work together on weatherization. Arlie is the executive director of Advocates, and uh, you know we're lobbying on the Hill every day for the weatherization program. Please contact either one of us. We would be glad to work directly with you uh, to get you engaged in trying to save the appropriations for this program. And again, Carol, our appreciation to you for providing this venue today. Thank you. Well, let's open it up for your questions and comments. Do we have any? your chance to hear from some very, very good speakers and folks who have put a lot of time and effort into making this program a success. And it's my understanding also that, that basically the program money that you mentioned that had been in the pipeline, say, six months ago or whatever like that, that basically by the, you know, that, that we are now looking at most states having spent out all of that money by the end of this year and that that um, and certainly by the beginning of the weatherization program year uh, right. the first of April Carol that that is correct you know we've done an analysis with uh, Bob Adams DOE and basically all of the recovery act dollars will be spent out the exception of two states and one territory there are a total of 59 grantees <clears throat> in the weatherization program and by the beginning of the weatherization 2013 program year, which is April 1 uh, for, for most states, some states are, are later, uh, but um, all but uh, two states and one territory, the Recovery Act dollars will be 100% spent out. In fact, by the end of this calendar year, uh, December 31st, 40 states will have spent out 100% um, of their Recovery Act dollars. There are actually two states right now, Minnesota and Vermont, that are out of both Recovery Act dollars and regular appropriations. Uh, there are two sources of, of funding for the states right now, the remaining Recovery Act dollars and the regular appropriations from FY11. Uh, Minnesota and Vermont will be living on LIHEAP and leveraged funds, utilities, until we get to another continuing resolution. 
because they are, they are sadly both out of fund. And we're going to see more states as we get to the end of the continuing resolution fall in that category. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, Matt DeFranti with Rebuilding Together. I understand that DOE is doing a process for sort of s standardizing certifications for weatherization workers. Can one of you talk a little to that? Well, um, I'm, I'm also a BPI board chair, so I've been very much involved in that process of sort of monitoring what's going on there. I think the, uh, it's, uh, it's an ambitious effort that DOE has taken on, and there are you know, four uh, key certifications on small home side, the focus, the energy auditor and, and crew chief and inspector and installer, those four. And um, it, it's a very positive process from my perspective. Um, the timing, given what we're just hearing, is it's disconcerting if we're not able to have uh, a $240 million or at least something in that range of funding level because, in fact, all everybody who's been in the program for years and competent to be able to pass those tests will be lost to the industry. Okay, if, if state after state has no money and runs out of money, by the time all that is rolling out over the next year, I mean, the pilot process in each of those four certifications is taking place right now. Um, so just the timing of this is wonderful initiative, but it's coming to this point in time, just as we may be having people just cast to the winds. So um, going back to the, the point here, it, we can't assume that everybody will stay in place. I remember the days in 19, what was it, 94, when we had a 54 or 47% national cut, and, and you know the 94, 95 era, New York happened to have a, a strong director who, looking at LAHEAP and all this, was able to have a transition plan so the cut didn't affect people. It was tra transition over time, and people could manage that. And the environment, what we're talking about uh, here, is that um, by next year, we'll have maybe the home performance contractor network, maybe, the, maybe a contractor network will be able to take full advantage of it, but weatherization uh, folks may not. And so it's a wonderful effort. It's been successful, but it's moving at a pace that is exactly not lining up with, with the funding cycle. Okay, there was a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you, you've mentioned uh, that this is, can be looked at as an investment, and one of the slides uh, showed um, how weatherization could save on energy subsidies. I was wondering if there's any economic analysis as to whether weatherization can be effectively paid for in savings to LIHEAP or other expenditures, and if so, over what period of time? Well, the average LIHEAP uh, benefit is probably around $400, and I heard today that the average savings from a weatherization project is probably around $400. But that keeps saving in weatherization investment, keeps saving year after year after year. And one shot cash, you got to get the next year's cash and the next year's cash. And I think the LIHEAP payments uh, also that are made vary greatly from state to state, depending upon the number of people that, that apply for the program and what those allocations climate, are. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I should, should add, by the way, that in New York, we've had between 60 and 80 percent of our weatherization program funding has actually come from LIHEAP. We've had, as, as many states do, a requirement of a percentage of LIHEAP goes to the long-term investment in energy efficiency, which states have found more proactive, more productive way. But again, that is frankly challenged as the weatherization program, if there's no match to match, <laughs> no program to match, it's not going to be LIHEAP funded solely. We run by the, in New York, for the last 20 years, the program has been run according to the weatherization DOE guidelines, not LIHEAP. We're using LIHEAP dollars as per federal statute allowing it to be done, okay, according to the weatherization guidelines. So 
just as utility dollars are affected by very much LIHEAP dollars are in many of the states that, that uh, use the two in conjunction with each other will be also at risk. Okay, other questions? Um, all right, okay, go ahead. Hi, I was wondering if there's been an estimate on any job losses or um, a decrease in weatherization houses without the funding. There's any figures for that? Uh, Alice, have you developed any numbers of projected uh, either, you know, the rate of layoffs or the, uh, Arlie, you want to speak to that? The number of jobs nationwide in weatherization is estimated about 25,000 pre-ARA. 15,000 jobs were added in just weatherization workers alone during our, so those 15,000 go away, but the pro and then an additional 25,000 are at risk. That's just, that's just the direct, that's just direct jobs yeah. in the state and crews. That's not counting all the contractors who've also and hired other supply individuals chain and supply losses. chain. We don't have yeah. those numbers. Yeah. We should do some work to try to get them, frankly. I mean, it is a, it is a challenging environment when we know we added 1,400 jobs in New York. But that's directly attributable to ERA. But it, the supply chain, those contractors, I mean, we deal with those contractors and they're all being affected. They're small, on average, they're small businessmen who are very much affected by the cash flow is affected. And it'll be the same thing at the manufacturing level, too. And you could very well, if you have on again, off again funding, you could end up with an industry that looks like the wind industry, which has gone, you know, they've they're doing much better now, but has lower domestic content than the weatherization industry has, and that's because there hasn't been stable demand every year for the last 30 years. Um, I think I could speak to that a little bit. I'm Dan Reber from the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation in New York City. Um, if the doom and gloom appears to uh, stay in place, then our program would be looking at losing anywhere from three to four staff members um, three of which were hired for ARA. Um, so if my agency loses three or four people and there are 900 plus subgrantees in the nation and anywhere from one to four of those subgrantees could lose somebody. And so if you, if you do, the, do the math, um, just at the local subgrantee level, you would lose jobs. And then just as was said before, there's the contractors who would not be getting work because of the reduced funding, the manufacturers who don't supply the materials that get installed in people's homes, the people who don't save money, the low-income people who don't save the money, who then are either deciding whether to heat or eat. Yeah. That's the message we need to take to the Hill. Uh, thank you for stating that. You, know, you stated the case very, very well. That's what members of Congress respond to. And we're going to be doing lobby days as we go through the next three to four months. We'll ask you guys to come back down and, and work with us on that because that jobs message, that's, that's what's going to save this program if we can uh, get that through to, to the members. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Wendell Rice, and I'm from the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation in Brooklyn, one of the oldest community development corporations in the country. Uh, it's been bothering me for uh, maybe the second year in R. And we all would agree that employment job is very important. Uh, our presidents are stumbling through the country talking about employment, employment, people who don't have jobs. But first of all, I think the numbers are wrong because uh, with all the, as it is mentioned, all the material that we use from the manufacturers, for, for instance, refrigerators, uh, they had to put on more people to make all those refrigerators that we buy and putting these people homes. So is all the other materials from the factories. And uh, right now, the cooling program. Ain't no way in the hell people would buy, would buy all the, the air conditioners to put in their homes that we are installing because we've been getting like 400 calls a day, or more than that. And so um, people had to hire more people to do this work. And uh, I think we got uh, some of our numbers lost. It just have not been mentioned to by people. Let me just just add one thing, and that is the contractors uh, nationally, in terms of this whole notion of the supply chain, 
uh, a very large percentage of all weatherization work actually is done by subcontractors, and those are procurement terms that are developed state by state, but ultimately it's subcontractors doing the work. I mean, there's a fair number in some states and small homes of work done by crew, but it really is not just the numbers that Dan mentioned of the people working for the agency, but literally the subcontractors doing all the work. And if that work is not being funded this way, uh, it, those folks will lose their jobs. And I think that analysis of, of all of the people in that chain, of the number of jobs there, that has not been part of ERA reporting. And no matter how well ERA reporting has been put in place, it could not track uh, the multiplier effect and the economy and all the jobs affected by the work that's been done with the, you know, with $5 billion. I, I think it's important and, and clearly one of the things that we were hoping that people would come away with today is an under, a little bit better understanding of how complex this story really is because it not only accomplished its mission of, of going out and weatherizing a lot of homes. But as a result of that, we saw something else also really happen in terms of the training of, you know, the development of that human infrastructure, which is so critical to providing the kinds of skills and and uh, people infrastructure that we really need in terms of thinking about all of the things that need to be done with our buildings across the country, and that that is an enormous achievement. What we've also been hearing about supply chain, that it's not just kind of one, one program here, it is how it has really affected so much other things, and that therefore there are so many businesses and manufacturing companies, et cetera, that are all part of this whole story. And I'm not sure how many of us really knew how big this whole story was going to be. I think it's a pretty incredible story uh, and that um, and, and that it's a, a wonderful success. It would be a shame now not to be able to truly capitalize on this investment for the country in terms of looking at at providing a bright future for for um, households and for people looking for for solid jobs making a real difference in American homes and buildings across the country. So I want to thank you all very, very much for being here today. I want to thank our speakers. We have a last word over here. I, I Go just, ahead. I, we were talking about how many people, but I think it might be good to add to the dialogue is who the people are. Mm -hmm. Uh, because a lot of the people who work in these for these contractors are not very highly educated, and that's where the high unemployment rate is. So it's the people who are in that category with the higher unemployment rates, and veterans that that taking these jobs. I was struck by that young man who said he'd been in the field for eight years, and really liked making people's home better, but he liked learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a guy who probably never graduated from. He might. I shouldn't say that, but. Here's a man who is at that age saying, I like learning. And there's a lot of dynamic and, and, and richness in, in knowing who these people are as well as how many of them. I, I have to try to just add one thing with these last few comments. We've been, done the last three years a lot of workforce development training. And I have to say that, and we've actually ended up hiring an awful lot of people through that process. But the amazing thing is the diversity of the unemployed people coming to us, long-term unemployed coming to us for training. A lot of those become career switchers. A lot of those weren't just the persons who didn't have the high school diploma. A lot of those were persons who've been laid off in their 30s or 40s and have had difficulty getting a job, okay? But the passion, we, because we've had a, a really interesting energy efficiency technician program and a, where we've really been introducing people to a whole series of possible jobs in the field. But we really have gotten them sort of committed to working in sort of green industry. And believe it or not, in this society today, we have an amazing readiness of people to really jump in and get passionately committed to this field. The notion that we could be, as we have more and more people introduced to the green jobs and the potential in the industry, to shut down 
in effect, defund the infrastructure that has been the historic base for all of this? It's just astonishing. So your call for this national coalition, we, we jump on board. Well, he didn't and learn he it. He job. still wants to be learning. I mean, we all learn more after college than and we do in college, 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 don't we? He came to me right after college. Yeah. He couldn't find a job in his field. Yeah. So he came to me right after college, and he loves it. So, which is actually majors. a wonderful, wonderful story in itself. So I want to thank you all very, very much for, for being here. Please feel free to follow up with any of the speakers. Please watch Mark's, the film that Mark is distributing. I, I think it, because we must remember this very, very important human face and everything that has been accomplished. Thank you all very, very much.